Good afternoon, everyone. Most people have heard of the name Abraham, know a little bit about him, and um, we're going to try and talk about Abraham, not, not covering all the ground by any means, but I'm going to try and show this afternoon that he is a great biblical character. Now, people have heard of him in as much as that um, many would know that it's something to do with the Jews, that he may well be the, the ancestor of all the Jews. And for those in the Muslim world and so on, they would understand Abraham being the father of, of, of the Arabs and so forth. And what's sometimes overlooked is that Abraham figures large in true Christian understanding. And so we as Christadelphians rejoice in Abraham very much. And as I say, I'm not going to cover all the ground this afternoon, but... I'll give you some sort of a sketch of the main ideas associated with Abraham and why it's so important for those who would follow Christ. Um, just consider these opening words I'm going to give you now from the Apostle Paul. Even as Abraham believed God, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which are of faith are blessed with faith for Abraham. Now there's such a lot in those uh, words there I've just uh, quoted to you. But we see that there's righteousness associated with Abraham, faith is uh, associated with him the gospel message was preached to him and all those who are counted to be faithful are blessed with faithful abraham so he's a big big character um christ is at the center obviously of the the hope of a christian goes almost without saying of course he is christ is the main main character but Abraham is a leading figure in the purpose of God also. Well, turn with me first to the book of Genesis. We're going to spend a bit of time in Genesis. It's where we read of Abraham and his life. And we're going to uh, Genesis chapter 12. He's mentioned briefly at the end of chapter 11, but we're going to pick it up in the beginning of chapter 12. And we see God calling Abraham and giving him promises to live by and to hope in. And so we read now, The Lord has said to Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I'll make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I'll bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And as we read on from chapter 12 into 13, 14, 15 and so on, we see Abraham on his journey. We see God working in his life. But here we see in these opening words of Genesis 12, the call for him to leave from his hometown, his home area, which, um, putting it very simply in, in, in our terms today, is modern um, Iraq. He was to move from that area, not knowing altogether where he was going to go, but God was showing him another land, another place. And so we see that he set, sets out in faith, and in verse 2, Abraham was promised that in this place, that from him there would be a great nation. He was told that he would be famous, his name would be great. And we, we've already alluded to that in my very, very opening remarks this afternoon. We're saying that we know, we think of Jew, Jewish people, we think of Abraham, we think of Ab Arabs, we think of Abraham, we think of Christians, we think of Abraham. He's famous, there's no question of that, it's already come to pass. But in verse 3, God also says, I'll bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And 
vitally important, and this is a, of all the promises given here, of all the aspects to the promises given here to Abraham, the major, major thing we ought to have in mind is the last words of verse 3. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And so Abraham, he wouldn't know altogether at this point much about how that was going to happen. But God tells him from the outset, as he starts off in his journey, or before he starts his journey in fact, he tells him that as he goes and walks in faith, that the purpose of God is that in him, some way, by men and women having a relationship with him, all the families or all the peoples of the earth will be blessed. So it's not just a question of him and the family that he would have, the children, the grandchildren, so on, that they would be blessed, but all people will be blessed. It's an amazing promise that at the end of verse 3. God says that all the different peoples in the fullness of this, these promises are blessed because they have an association with Abraham. And, uh, you know, it's, it's absolutely remarkable. And we're going to see how that develops a little bit this afternoon. But before we leave Genesis 12, just come down to verse 7. And the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, unto, un, said to him, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Now at this point, Abraham's made the journey and he's in the heart of what we know today as modern Israel. He's in what we know today as Shechem. And he's there and he builds this altar. It's the first altar that he builds for God in the land of promise. And God speaks to him again. And he says, unto thy seed will I give this land. And that idea of the seed, it makes us think of his children. And that's true, that the land of Israel is promised to Abraham's descendants, flesh and blood. But it means more than that. When we look at the Bible more fully and more carefully and we look at other passages, we understand there's a sense of this word that it's singular, that there's one in particular also that God is making mention of. He's actually talking of the descendant of all descendants of Abraham, even the Lord Jesus. And it's a, it's a very important fact that we understand and appreciate that Lord Jesus, although he be son of God, is also flesh and blood, a descendant of Abraham, is, a, is the son of Abraham, and he is spoken of here unto thy seed, unto Christ. Will I give this land? So there's a sense where it's there for these children, many, the multitude, but also one in particular. And there's another idea about that seed which we're going to touch upon in, in, in due course. Okay, let's just move over now into chapter 13 and look at verse 14. Because Abraham, through his life, uh, at various points in his long life, God gives him further revelation and speaks again of these promises, tells him more about these promises. And here we read in chapter 13, verse 14, the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, this is his nephew, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward, southward, eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And we just pause there. Abraham's told, look in every direction, all that you can behold is not only for your seed, to thee will I give it, says the Lord, and to thy seed forever. So not only is it for your children, it's also to be for you personally, Abraham. Now that's new. He hasn't been told, he wasn't told that in Genesis 12. But here, 
Abram's told that he will possess this land as well as his descendants. And to know how many of those descendants are, well, look at verse 16. Or make thy seed as the dust of the earth. So that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. And so he's going to have a great multitude associated with him. And God tells him in verse 17, Arise, walk through the land in the length of it, and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Second time he's told. The Lord is emphatic, I will give it to you. The amazing thing is, as we go through Abraham's life, He didn't even have a burial ground for his wife Sarah. He had nowhere that belonged to him. He lived in a tent. And his children, uh, at the end of his days, which were more than a few, were not a multitude as described here, I hasten to add, like verse 16. But nevertheless, the children they had, they also lived in tents. So Abraham died not having received the promise. And it still awaits fulfilment. And so Abraham will be raised from the dead. He will be given immortality and he will be given the land, which first and foremost, as we can see from here, is the land of Israel. But we're going to move on. We're going to go to Acts chapter 3 into the New Testament. Some people think, well, Abraham's just an Old Testament character, isn't he? But actually, he's mentioned quite a bit in the New as well. We're just going to look at one or two passages today. So there's, there's a lot written about Abraham. We're just picking up some main ideas associated with him. Now the land that he saw and was promised to Abraham, first and foremost is the land of Israel. Of course, that's where he was. That's what he could physically see. But later on, the apostle tells us, the apostle Paul tells us, for the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So he actually tells us, makes it absolutely clear that the whole earth is actually promised to Abraham as a result of his faith, taking God at his word, believing in his promises and endeavouring to live a godly life. So it's not just Israel, even the whole earth. But I've taken you now to Acts chapter 3 and we have a speech here by Peter and this is after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and he's speaking of the Lord Jesus and is endeavouring to, to encourage his fellow Jews and those that were listening on to learn more of him and to recognise that he is the promised saviour and we're just going to pick it up in verse 12 when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we made this man to walk? And he, he's making reference to a lame man that's miraculously been given the ability to walk, even though he'd been lame from birth. And this miracle was done not so much by Peter, but the Lord Jesus through Peter and John. And the people are marvelling and wondering at him and he's saying it's through the Lord Jesus that this man's able to walk. This miracle that you're seeing is a witness, is a proof in the resurrected Lord Jesus. And then he talks further, verse 13, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers hath glorified his son. Jesus. So he relates Jesus directly to Abraham, Abraham's son, Isaac, 
Abraham's grandson Jacob the God of our fathers these are the patriarchs they are linked bound up together and it's the God of Abraham that's caused this miracle to happen and he then talks of Christ he talks of him being delivered up in verse 13 to Pilate and so on he talks of him verse 15 even though he be the prince of life being killed but he also says in verse 15 whom God hath raised from the dead whereof we are witnesses and so he speaks to them of Christ Jesus being the perfect sacrifice for sin the one in which righteousness can be given by grace and as he does so he talks of wondrous things look at verse uh, 19 repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus the Christ which before was preached unto you whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his pro holy prophets since the world began so he talks of the second coming of Christ and with the second coming of Christ there's to be a time of refreshing there's a time of restitution of things made right and wholesome things made right for Israel first and foremost and then for all the earth overall um, and I'm going to come down now to verse 25 and his audience made, m m mostly made up of Jews descendants of Abraham flesh and blood he says ye are the children of the prophets <coughs> and Abraham also was a prophet I'm going to look at that aspect now but he too was a prophet he's, a, he's counted amongst all those ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant this is the promise covenant which God made with our fathers Abraham Isaac and Jacob his son his grandson were given the promises just the same and then he just briefly makes mention of it doesn't go through all the details he just makes a little reference saying unto Abraham and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed unto you first God having raised up his son Jesus sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities so in verse 25 Peter is reminding his audience that the great hope given to Abraham was that in him all the kindreds or all the nations of the earth would be blessed that was the great hope for Abraham the great vision that all men and women would live in harmony and blessed before God and Abraham was told that this would happen not only in himself but look at these words again and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed and now he's talking about the seed singular he's been preaching about Jesus of Nazareth and he's saying through Jesus the promises given to Abraham are made secure the promises are guaranteed and in verse 26 he says unto you first God having raised up his son Jesus sent him to bless you first because after the Jews the gospel message is going to go beyond Jerusalem beyond Israel into the into the nations into the world at large but they were the first to hear of it and we have an interesting aspect to the promises here in verse 26 that involved in that blessing is that they should turn every one of you from his iniquities that there is forgiveness through the death 
and resurrection of Christ Jesus. There's forgiveness in this seed of Abraham. So Abraham wasn't just blessed with land, with inheritance, territory. He was promised forgiveness. And it's through the Lord Jesus that this forgiveness is graciously extended unto those who have faith in him and in the promises made secure by him. And there is no resurrection for Abraham. There's no resurrection for Isaac and Jacob. No resurrection for the prophets. There's no resurrection for all the faithful, Jew or gentle. There's no resurrection unto immortality and life unless sin has been overcome and sin has, has taken away. And the Lord Jesus, through his sacrifice, gives men and women that hope. And this is the message that Peter's giving forth here. He's saying to these people in, in his audience, the Saviour has come. The seed of Abraham has come. He has become the sacrifice to take away the sin of the world. And the promises will come to pass. That which was promised to the fathers will be a reality. Just coming back, verse 19 just want to go over this here just make sure we've got this understanding repent ye therefore be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus the Christ which was be preached unto you whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things and so forgiveness is also associated with the promises given to Abraham and Abraham we go through his life and we re know that he, he comes to, to appreciate this and understand this and uh, to, to learn of the need of a sacrifice whereby sin and death can be overcome right let's now have a look at um, Psalm 72 now just very quickly And this is a psalm, a song, a prayer that David, King David gives with his son Solomon in mind. And perhaps at the top of your psalm, you've got a heading, a psalm for Solomon. Verse 1, give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. But such is the wonder of scripture, as David is praying for his son Solomon... <coughs> He's also given a prophecy about a greater descendant, the seed of David. And as David likewise was the seed of Abraham, so Christ Jesus, seed of David, he's talking about Messiah. And we read early all the way through Psalm 72, and what a wonderful psalm it is. It's a picture of Christ reigning as King of kings and Lord of lords upon the earth. Just to pick up verse 6, he shall come down like rain upon the mown grass, as showers that water the earth. In his days shall the righteous flourish, and abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. You know, these are wonderful words, and uh, for those living in the Middle East, to hear rain spoken of, of showers promised, probably carries much more weight than it does for, for us here in Doncaster or where I come in Coventry in the UK. We, we probably think we have too much rain, but I assure you in the Middle East, rain is absolutely vital. And where you can see the land watered, then you see growth and life. But where there's a lack of water, even in Israel, let alone the Arab line, lands round about, there's desert and there is wilderness. And so it, the Lord Jesus' is coming is described in this wonderful way as if his rain life-giving water and the righteous flourish we read in verse 7 um, how we long for the days for that in a world where there are so many brutes that take the leadership and the headship in so many nations of the earth 
But no, the righteous will not just exist. The righteous don't survive by the skin of their teeth. The righteous flourish. Read in verse 8, he shall have dominion from also from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth. Talks of this one, not only being the ruler in Israel, but also of the whole earth. Verse 11, all kings shall fall down before him, all nations shall serve him. Verse 12, he shall deliver the needy when he crieth the poor also, and him that hath no helper. He shall spare the poor and needy, and shall save the souls of the needy. So this is wonderful prophecy of the Lord Jesus and of the kingdom age to come. But I want to come to the end of the psalm now. And we read in verse 17. His name shall endure forever. His name should be continued as long as the sun. And men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Well, this now is a re-echo. This is just a, this is a sounding forth again of the promises that we read of Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. Abraham was told that all the nations of the earth would be blessed in him. Here we're told that in Christ Jesus, all the nations are to be blessed. But you see, it's true on both accounts, because Jesus of Nazareth is a descendant of Abraham. He's from his very loins. And it's through the seed of Abraham, the Lord Jesus, and men and women being associated with the Lord Jesus, that all nations are to be blessed. And it's he, above all, that they call the Blessed One. Verse 18, Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel. Reference back to the, to, uh, the grandson of Abraham, back to the patriarchs, who only doeth wondrous thing. And blessed be the, his glorious name forever, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. And so this is the great hope for those who read the Bibles carefully and understand the real purpose of the Lord Jesus' life and of his second coming. But it's also a fulfilment of the promises given to Abraham. Final passage uh, this afternoon, Galatians chapter 3. And the Apostle Paul writes to newly baptised believers of the Lord Jesus, not to one church or one ecclesia, but a number of ecclesias in Galatia, which is an area of Turkey. And he writes to these, many of which are Gentile, many of which would know very little of Abraham until they received the gospel message but they're going to know about Abraham now whether the Gentiles or whether they're Jews and have known of him right from their early days they're going to know of him now because we read in verse 6 even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children or the seed of Abraham and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen or the Gentiles the non-Jews through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham saying in thee shall all nations be blessed so then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham and so we see those promises that were given in Genesis 12, those things that Abraham was told to embrace and to live by and to hope in, those things we read in those early chapters of Genesis 12 are now brought out again. Abraham believed God. He left the place of his birth and he went forth on the journey and he went into the land of Israel and he 
trusted in God and believed in God that he would have descendants many and there would be one in particular and because of that faith Abram is reckoned to be righteous and it's the same with all men and women even though we are not righteous that we all commit sin even in our best endeavours weak and as perverse as we are we fall short nevertheless if we have faith in the promises and in the righteousness through the Lord Jesus Christ he who is the righteous one he is the godly one whose sacrifice is to take the sin of the world away if we have faith in him then as it was with Abraham so it would be with us know ye therefore they which are of faith verse 7 the same are the children of Abraham now this is interesting because we've got children of Abraham flesh and blood which we call Jews today and we've got the idea of the seed being Jesus in particular singular but make no mistake about it we've also got children more than flesh and blood the criteria the factor that makes them a child of Abraham is not their pedigree or their ancestry but it's their faith and if we have faith like unto Abraham we believe in the promises given to Abraham Isaac to Jacob we believe in the descendant of Abraham that will overcome sin and death for us if we have that faith then are we also the seed of Abraham we are his children and in verse 8 the Apostle Paul by the Spirit makes it quite clear that the scriptures spoke of these things and what scripture is he talking about he's talking about Genesis 12 and at the end of that verse 8 he reminds us of it in thee shall all nations be blessed so those in those Galatian ecclesias were now being blessed and will be blessed with immortality in life if they kept faith because they walk with understanding such as Abraham had the promises and their fulfillment in Christ Jesus the, the greatest descendant of Abraham verse 9 so them which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham now coming down to verse 16 um, it's interesting here he wants to make this clear does the apostle that we understand what's meant by the seed now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made he saith not unto seeds as of many but as of one and to thy seed which is Christ and this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before God in Christ the law which was 430 years after cannot disannul that it should be made the promise of none effect now the law which Orthodox Jewry even today delights so much in the law came way after the times of Abraham not even in the book of Genesis the law is a separate thing to be looking at and to consider these promises are foremost in every sense of that word and these promises given to Abraham should be given full weight and he emphasizes in verse 16 that whilst the promises given to Abraham yes involved a multitude when he talks about the gospel here we have to be very mindful of the fact that it also talks about to the seed not as of many but as of one and to thy seed not Isaac Christ God promised Christ way back there in Genesis and it's through Christ it's this seed that men and women Jew and Gentiles have to be associated with and so now we come to the end of the chapter verse 26 
and how rich these words are. Fear all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptised into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female. If you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now this is a very important passage regarding adult baptism. Very important passage. And those that say that baptism is an optional thing that a Christian may or may not enter into, well they need to, to consider again this passage here. This passage obviously talks of the importance of baptism. And it's through baptism that one declares their faith in the promises given to Abraham and they're outworking in the life, the death and the glorious resurrection of Christ Jesus. It's through baptism one becomes associated. And in verse 28, there's a great emphasis on the oneness of it all. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. All one in Christ Jesus. Come back to verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as, as of one. And to thy seed which is Christ. So the promises of inheritance of the land, of a needful resurrection to obtain that land, of immortality in life and the kingdom age to come, of living in that wonderful um, dispensation such as we've read there in Psalm 72 and we come under the, the rulership and witness the peace and the joy of the kingdom age through Christ Jesus. All that has been about being of one. Men and women have to be one with Abraham. One with Christ Jesus. We all have to be as of one part of the seed. So the promises can be given to you and to I. And it's baptism that does it. So in verse 28, he's got all these different categories of different people. But it doesn't, where you, it doesn't matter where you hail from or where you come from, what cultural background you've had. If you step out and decide to walk in faith, like Abraham walked in faith, and you embrace the promises that the patriarchs embraced, and you understand the saving work of the Lord Jesus, if you understand those things and decide to be a faithful man or woman before God, and you are baptised in faith in those promises, and in those wondrous things worked out in Christ Jesus, ye are all one. And then the logic flows. Verse 29. And if you be Christ, because you're in Christ, you've been baptised into Christ, you are one with Christ, and if you be Christ, then you're Abraham's seed. And heirs according to the promise. And so Abraham is a very, very important character in the Bible. And the promises given to Abraham need to be understood. And those of us who by the grace of God know of these things ought to rejoice mightily that we have such an understanding and that Lord Jesus is soon to come and give life to Abraham and all those that have died in faith having not yet received the promises for at his coming they certainly will.